Good morning, folks. I'm going to uh, try to quickly run through a summary of the banning and ban encounter data that we have in the BBL acquired over the last 50 plus years. And this is going to be a very cursory summary. There's not a lot of quantitative analysis here, and uh, so uh, I'm not going to continue too many, uh, too many, too much statistics at this point. Um, in terms of banding, we have about 325,000 kestrels have been banded in, in the United States and Canada since 1960. Um, you can see this slide by here. The, the peak banding was in the uh, early 1990s. And uh, as you recall from John's talk this morning, kestrel populations were actually declining at that point. So the, the increase you're seeing during the 70s and 80s probably reflects increased effort and interest in banding kestrels and young kestrels. Um, and then probably the, the decline since the, the early 1990s may very well reflect the changes in kestrel populations that have occurred um, since that time. In terms of the, the ages of the kestrels that have been reported to us, um, local L stands for locals, and those are birds that are banded in the nest or very shortly after leaving the nest. Uh, so they, they're about 137,000, over a third of the birds are, are basically nestlings. Um, and the rest are the, the other age categories. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to vouch for those who are claimed to be third year birds, but um, <laughs> just claim that. Um, over time, looking at just the comparison between the, the banding of local birds, birds in the nest, with the, the, the hatchier or, or adult or after hatchier birds, most of those were, many of those were probably banded uh, during migration or, or maybe during winter. You can see some differences. The, the, uh, uh, the local birds are blue and, and the peak in the 90s and it goes down. Uh, for the other age classes, there's actually you know, more, more banding going on in the 70s and 80s, which reflected probably greater interest in banding the, the migrant raptors, kestrels, and other, other species at that point. And then again, they also peaked at about the mid 90s, and there's been a decline. So that's <coughs> In terms of where the birds banded, this is sort of a fairly common pattern. Uh, just historically, bird banding efforts have been greatest in the sort of between New England and the Mid Atlantic region and the Great Lakes states. Uh, sort of that in provinces, that's where a lot of bird banding has been done historically and also for kestrels. There's also been a lot of activity banding in the western part of the United States. Um, fair amount of work down in Florida that, that, that may represent a lot of what John's been doing among others. Um, and there's some fairly big gaps where there's been not a lot of festival banding going on. When you break it down a little bit because the political boundaries don't necessarily mean a lot, this, this is by 10 minute block and I've, I've removed those blocks where there are just one or two kestrels so you can so get a better indication of where the, where the, the most the, the greatest number of birds have been banded. So you can see like for Ontario, there's you know, nothing about what's going on around James Bay or the border forest, all the bands down along the, the Great Lakes. Um, but again, it's a fairly similar pattern with a lot of the effort in the Great Lakes, Mid-Atlantic, um, New England area, uh, also California, it's a bit more spotty in the, in the Western United States. And uh, certainly in at least the United States, the Great Plains and the southern part of the continent are a lot been going on. When you look at where the most band of kestrels have been banded, um, actually the, the largest number is in Hawk Cliff, so of that 34,000 or whatever it was in Ontario, um, over two thirds of those were just at this one location. Um, and and that, it's, this isn't too surprising because most of these places you probably, you probably have heard of Hawk Cliff, Cape May, uh, Hawk Ridge, you know, these are fairly well known as hawk migration uh, concentration points, and, and that's also where a lot of the migration banding has gone on. Uh, but some, you know, a couple of these may also represent some fairly intensive nest box studies that have been going on for a long period of time. Um, just to, to briefly show what's, uh, how it's broken down by season during the winter, and, and also geographically, uh, the winter banding. Um, Actually, there hasn't been, been a lot going on in the winter, and most of it is, again, sort of the same patterns of the Atlantic Great, Great Lakes states over a lot in California. It's a little bit more down in the Gulf Coast, but it's, again, mostly Texas and Florida, if, you know, where any winter banks has been going on. And there's a big hole here in the southeastern United States, which I'm going to talk about more in a little bit. In spring, 
Uh, it, it's actually the season with the, the least amount of banding, which again isn't too surprising. Uh, there's a few places along the Atlantic coast and Great Lakes where you get a, a concentration of migrating raptors, and there's some uh, concentration of kestrel banding. But it's broke mostly a broad front migration, especially through the mid-continent, and uh, there's been, not been a lot of uh, banding that's going on during the spring. During summer, and, and these are primarily nest box studies, so you can see about 170. 9,000 birds banded in the summer, so 137,000 locals. You get some idea of the proportion of those nests, of, of the nest box studies. And again, there, there's a pretty good scatter. There's again a lot in the New England, uh, Mid Atlantic, Great Lakes, but there's a lot more scattered nest box studies in the prairie provinces of Canada and even other places in the, in the, in the United States. So there's, you know, there's been a fair amount of banding going on in, in, for, during the summertime. And, we have a fairly rich data set that's fairly wide, probably the best geographic distribution of banding for um, any of the seasons that we have for Kestrel. <clears throat> and to, to wrap up the, the fall, this is a, a fairly expected pattern. There's a lot of banding along the, the Atlantic coast. We know there's a lot of Kestrels and other falcons move along the coast, also on the Great Lakes. And, and again, that's, that's not a surprise there. And a fair amount also in, in California. So um, basically, uh, to summarize the banding data, we've got a large data set. You know, 325,000 is a lot of records. Um, you know, at this point, uh, you know, the one thing that we have an interest in, interest in is looking at the, the survivorship of the locals. You know, we've got 137,000 local kestrels banded, um, and if we can't say anything develop any sort of reasonable survivorship estimates from a sample size of that, we're doing something wrong in terms of our banding effort. So you know, this is something we, we plan on doing in, in, in the near future. I'm talking about that a little bit more, but basically, you know, I think there's a, well, there's, this is a pretty rich data set that we can explore and, and hopefully uh, get some useful information that may be applicable to the, the, the conservation and management of kestrels. I think the other question that we have is also what information can we glean from the migration data? Um, can we say something about changes in sex ratios over time maybe, or age ratios over time, or is there anything that we can glean from the migration data other than movements? And that's, you know, again, that's an open question and something we'll be looking at. Now in terms of the, the, the data gaps, you know, one is, is up, there's very little banging been done up in the oil forest and Alaska, the northern part of the range, and that's not surprising. There's not a lot of kestrels and, and access up there, not a lot of people, and access up there is, is challenging. Um, in the United States, um, the Great Plains, there's a big swath through the middle of the country where we know very little about what's going on here with kestrels. And then also in the southeast, um, there's been a lot of banding in Florida. There's interest in the, the resident uh, race in the southeast because it's a been of conservation concern for a number of years, but really, what's really going on down there in the winter time across the southeast, there's not been a lot of a lot of work, especially banding work that, that's going on. And, and when I start talking to a lot of counties, I'll say a little bit more about that. Now that the encounter records, uh, we've got about 5,300 encounter records dating back to 1960. Uh, our banding data is only computerized from 1960 on. The account records, we computerized everything going back to 1914. So there's about 400 or so additional uh, account records that are, are before 1960, but for comparative purposes, I've, I've uh, limited these to just the 1960 to, to the current for, for the account records. And the interesting thing about the account records is there's sort of an increase in about 1970, early 1970s. And then for a long time, it stayed fairly, fairly constant in around about 100, roughly 100 encounter records a year. And then recently it shot up, which is not what kestrel populations are doing. And don't ask me why, I have no explanation. If you have one, John, I'd love to hear it. But, uh, um, you, know, it's, you know, it's sort of surprising. You know, I wasn't expecting that. So anyway, um, you know, we have a, a, a fairly long-term encounter set data set going back to the 1970s, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we have here now. In terms of the, the geographic distribution, it's uh, 
And a lot of it reflects where the banding effort's been, and some of that is probably not accidental. There's a number of the encounters, especially probably in the early years, where birds that were, were uh, recaptured at, uh, at banding operations, at the migration banding operations. So there's a lot, oops, there's a lot of records from Ontario and <coughs> Wisconsin and some of these places where there's also been a lot of banding effort, and that's pretty much the pattern here for, for the most part. That the, uh, the encounter records reflect also where the banding's been done. Uh, basically, what, uh, just a, a couple of summaries, and this is what I looked at, or one, one summary we did is for the kestrels that were banded in winter, the winter season as we defined before, which is December through February, and, and re-encountered in the summertime. And that it's not necessarily a direct encounter, meaning the same year as they were banded, it could be several, you know, multiple years afterwards. But when you look at it, it's sort of interesting because a lot of the winter banding and the and the summer where they're you're encountering in the summer, there's a lot of birds that really aren't moving anywhere. And um, put that, you know, just keep that in mind for a minute. Clearly in the for uh, Florida you start to see the pattern of movement along the Atlantic coast. But most of the birds banded in the winter also tend to be recaptured basically in fairly close by, nearby in the summertime. Now, the, this is the opposite. These are kestrels that were banded in the summer and, and encountered in, and recovered in the winter. And here you start to see some different patterns. Uh, there's still a lot of resident birds. In the, you know, if you look in here, there's a lot of birds where there aren't any lines. So there's a lot of birds that, that basically, um, are again, are being and ca banded and encountered in, in roughly the same place. Uh, but you start to see some, some patterns, and, and especially you look, look here, and you see that the birds from the Great Lakes and the, the Atlantic coast, they're all going down to southeastern United States. Now, there's, you know, there may be a few more going down to, say, to Cuba and to the Yucatan, and based on the, the migration counts at uh, Key West, you know, there's probably more than just that one, represented by that one dot. But still, the primary wintering range for the migratory birds from from basically east of the Rocky Mountains is all going to be pretty much in a fairly small area in the southeastern United States. Now the western birds, uh, west of the Rockies, they're all going to Mexico. This is where they're going, the migratory birds. There's you know, it's a little bit of short distance movement that we're, that we're getting, but not much. And most of the most of the migration is going down into Mexico. So clearly you have some very, you know, between east and west, you have some very different movement patterns that, can also be uh, might uh, you know uh, have some um, influence on the factors that are affecting the population uh, trends. And and based on what's going on here, I don't think there's any one single explanation that's going to explain what's going on with festival populations region-wide. I think it's going to be a, a multiple factors that are that are involved. And just looking at it a little bit more closely, you can see there's a very distinct movement basically east of the Appalachians. There's a you know the down to Florida, maybe Georgia, you know, but the birds from the Great Lakes, there's a few that, you know, it's a little bit of overlap, but basically the Appalachians is a pretty good dividing line between uh, the <coughs> populations. Uh, it's not, doesn't show so, so well here, but uh, and there, are, there may be more, but certainly the, the Rocky Mountains seems to do the same thing. You have the birds from the Rocky, east of the Rocky Mountains are doing one thing, the birds west of the Rocky Mountains are, are doing something else. Now that when if you look at all the, this, these are all the summer banded uh, kestrels and all the encounters at any point, uh, you start to see that there's uh, about four major populations in this country. You have one that's along the Atlantic coast that really, you know, the, the Appalachian seems to be a fairly good dividing line. There, there is some overlap, especially in the winter range. The Great Lakes birds are going down mostly to the central Gulf Coast. If you go down to Georgia and Florida, if you come into Texas, the birds on the Great Plains are coming down along the Great Plains, mostly to Texas, Louisiana, again, some overlap with Great Lakes birds. If you're going down into eastern Mexico, and your western birds are pretty much, when they're moving, they're moving down into western Mexico. So, you know, at this point, you know, we did a very, you know, this is just a, a summary of what we have. You know, I looked at uh, like migration distance by age class at a very crude level, just across across regions and everything, and there was no difference at all. 
So, you know, I think that's something where uh, to get at the, the types of patterns that John talked about, you're going to have to do a bit more a more detailed analysis of the data to see what may actually be uh, borne out by the encounter records. But I suspect that the movement patterns may be more complex in all these regions than we realize. Um, certainly, there seems to be a migratory and resident uh, component to these populations to all to, throughout the country, which also has very important conservation implications because the factors in influencing the migratory populations are maybe different than those that are influencing resident populations. Um, and I think with additional analysis, they may reveal it, uh, uh, you know, more population structure. You know, there may be an east and west Great Lakes division. Within the west, you might have an intermountain versus uh, Pacific coast. You know, you know, there's probably more that could be pieced out of this data than we're able to do just in preparation for this presentation. And the thing that I would point out is the importance of southeastern United States as a wintering area for Kestrel. If you think about that breeding range, which goes all the way up to the basically to the to the tundra throughout Canada, United States, that's huge. And a lot of those birds are funneling into a fairly small area of this country. And what's not what's not uh, uh, surprise or, or, or what or, or you know the, the other thing that's going on in the southeast if you look at other open country birds larger head shrikes uh, bob white metal larks you just name it in the southeastern united states you see that same decline over the same time period and i don't think this is coincidental i don't think that you know, you know i think this is you know i think there's a reason for this so if i were really looking at the conservation of festivals at least east of the rockies um i think that's where i'd start Obviously, the western birds have different issues, but again, if you're, if you're familiar with what's going on, in, say, uh, especially northwest Mexico, a lot of land use changes going on down there. The native grasslands and deserts are being converted to ag fields, and again, you know, there could be the, you know, some habitat issues down there that could be uh, affecting testo populations. So Mexico, what's going on there is also really important for testo mm -hmm. as well, too. So that's my brief summary. Um, we are in, in the lab, or you know, a, a, as a result of, of this talk and, and the interest in the Kestrel partnership, we are going to try to we are going to uh, start a more detailed analysis of both of these data sets, and we certainly welcome uh, collaboration for those who have an interest in exploring it with us and have ideas on how we should explore it, because I think there's a lot to be mined out of these fairly rich data. Thank you.